Um, welcome, everybody, and a reminder that we have several hundred people on the web um, joining us that way. We have more people out in the real world um, uh, joining us, and we'll, uh, Peter will be talking about that in a little bit. My name's Ted Ganyets, and um, I'm one of the editors on the book that you're here to hear about today. Um, we're going to keep moving because these introductory comments, of course, are not as important as the, the meat of the matter, which is what the bulk of the day is about. Um, there is a, uh, a Twitter um, feed if you're interested in tweeting. Um, <clears throat> try not to have pictures of me in a tweet, just, you know, we, you can do better than that. <clears throat> and tr try not to tweet anything about any large company that makes airplanes, their stock is quite volatile at the moment. Um, so my job today is to give you a prehistory of the panel up to the time when the panel meets, and then I'll turn it over to Peter, who is one of the, uh, the co-chairs of the panel. And as you all know, back in 1996, the HHS had a book uh, we all called the Gold Book. Frankly, I was never sure. Was it called the Gold Book because it had a gold cover? Or did it have a gold cover because it was Martha Gold was the first editor or because it was the gold standard? It gets confusing. <clears throat> we scanned the editors. There was no color, and so we couldn't pick a color for this one. We decided to keep it gold. Um, the key on this book was the recommendation for a reference case, which was novel at the time, still important, and the emphasis on the cost per quality, which affirmed something that had been around for quite some time. And as everyone here knows, that book was and is, until now, um, a standard reference for cost effectiveness has been uh, referenced an incredible number of times. The original panel, uh, co-chaired by uh, Louise Russell, who's here, and Milt Weinstein, who's here, had on it Norm Daniels, who's here, Denny Fryback, Alan Garber, David Haydorn, Mark Kamlick, Joe Lipskin, who's here, uh, Brian Luce, who's here, um, Gene Mandelblatt, uh, Warren, uh, Willard Manning, Donald Patrick, and uh, George Torrance. Uh, Martha, again, was, one of the, was the first editor. And uh, obviously, not enough can be said about, uh, about that, uh, that effort. An absolutely amazing effort produced in a great book, and uh, 20 years ago, we had the rollout here in Washington. Um, since then, of course, a lot of things have happened. I won't itemize everything here, but you can see um, in 1990s and the 2000s, and even in the 2012-2014, uh, a lot of different activity that has helped shape and grow the cost effectiveness landscape. The one thing that's here that's a little bit misleading is the 2012 date. In 2011, uh, members of the uh, original editorial board uh, were participating in a series of phone calls um, uh, and, and a survey of the original panel members to find out, you know, is there a need for a book? Is there an interest in a book? And from that effort came the formation of the panel. Uh, the new panel has these people, uh, all of them here, or um, is, I'm not sure if Dan Brock made it, uh, all but Dan Brock here. And the important thing that we think is that of the people invited to participate in this effort, nobody said no. Um, and that's just remarkable. It speaks to the success of the first book and the importance that uh, for the experts in the field to see uh, um, for this second effort. Peter Newman and Julian Sanders were the, uh, the co-chairs and as you can see a wide range of uh, institutions and countries were represented. And with that, prehistory, we now let you get into uh, Peter Newman. Peter? Well, thank you very much, Ted, and good morning to all of you. And first, a big thanks to Ted, who was really a, a key catalyst in this effort and uh, brought us all together. So thanks, Ted. So I'm very pleased to moderate this first session this morning. And I want to start out just a little bit before I introduce the speakers uh, with a bit about the context and process that the second panel um, underwent. And I also want to start by recognizing uh, the first panel, the original panel as we call it, never the old panel, always the original panel. So, um, 
Ted mentioned some of them are here today. Milt and, and Martha, uh, Louise, Brian, uh, Joe Lipscomb, Norm Daniels. I hope I'm not missing anyone. Um, for the, really their remarkable work, uh, in terms of its comprehensiveness, its uh, balance, its thoughtfulness, its rigor, uh, really has set a standard for the last generation. And uh, at our very first meeting of the second panel, uh, we spoke about uh, the fact that we were standing on the shoulder, shoulders of giants, and uh, that it really our, our aspiration in, this, in producing this book was to uh, uh, meet the standards or produce a, a, a book uh, worthy of the, of the uh, first panel, the original panel. So in fact, I wonder if they might stand, uh, all the first original panel members, and we can give them a little round of applause and thank them for all their great work. So really, thanks to all of you. Also, just uh, wanted to acknowledge uh, funding for the second panel. I'm very grateful we had funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And Damian Walker from the Gates Foundation is here. Uh, Mike Painter of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, I believe is on the webcast. They were really instrumental uh, for the generous funding. So thank you very much. And also, um, very pleased to say we had a conference grant from AHRQ and in-kind funding from the Society of Medical Decision Making. Uh, all the funding went to support our meetings and a technical writer, and uh, really grateful for that. So the objectives of the second panel were similar to the first. Uh, review the state of the field and provide recommendations to improve the quality and comparability of cost-effectiveness analysis. The intended audience is also similar to the first panel. Policymakers of various stripes, um, public health officials, elected officials, uh, people writing clinical guidelines, people thinking about improving health and uh, given resource constraints, uh, certainly payers thinking about coverage and reimbursement, uh, researchers conducting their own analyses, uh, clinicians and, and patients thinking about healthcare decisions and uh, the clinical and economic consequences of, of their actions, and a whole host of others, employers, administrators, students, on and on. So just a little bit about our process. Ted mentioned a leadership group uh, from the original panel began thinking and planning for an update 2011 or so. Uh, second panel selected in late 2012. We had our first teleconference in January of 2013. After that, we had every six weeks, uh, the full panel met by teleconference. Uh, there was a lot more interaction between those uh, teleconferences. The leadership group has been meeting weekly uh, since early 2015 on the phone for a, an hour long call. A lot of interactions among the chapter authors um, and a lot of work, of course, done by email. Uh, we also met in person for uh, five rather intense uh, two-day, two-and-a-half-day sessions. So we met in Baltimore, we met in Bethesda, we met in Miami. It's a little bit like a tour, of, uh, a world tour, or at least a US tour. We met in Seattle. Um, after that, we had chapters reviewed, uh, both by external experts we asked to review chapters, I think three or four people for each chapter. We also posted the chapters for public comment, and uh, we, some of you in the, in the audience here on the webcast uh, commented and reviewed, very grateful to all of you. We had our final meeting in Boston, then we went into final editing and production, and uh, the JAMA paper that you have in your packet came out, and uh, the book out in the last uh, month or two. So um, here we are, just to give you a sense of it, here we are meeting in Seattle in uh, early 2015, hard at work, although some of us seem to be stretching, which <laughs> is okay, it's late in the day in Seattle and some of us are on East Coast time, so that's okay. But um, a couple of key considerations uh, throughout the process and to keep in mind during the day. Uh, first of all, how closely to adhere to the original panel? Um, Certainly, the original panel set a standard, but a lot of time has uh, passed, and uh, things have changed, and the new second panel brought its own sort of judgments and, and sensitivities, and so uh, we had a high bar to change original recommendations. We debated recommendations, but we do make some changes, and uh, we'll talk about those today. Um, theory versus pragmatism. This was uh, a theme throughout. Uh, what are the conceptual underpinnings? Um, 
Uh, what are we optimizing? How uh, closely do we adhere to welfare economic principles and, uh, and so forth and so on? On the one hand, on the other hand, uh, realizing that there are many decision-making contexts. Different budget holders have different uh, considerations. So um, you'll hear a lot more about this, in particular from David Meltzer and Mark Sculfer, uh, but others as well. Um, how prescriptive to be? Uh, certainly we wanted to be as helpful as we could to the field, but also realize that being overly prescriptive has its downsides. Um, analyst burden. This uh, is something we anticipated and we heard about when we posted the comments and uh, perhaps we'll continue to hear about. Um, we think we, we got the balance right. And in fact, we have two worked examples in the book uh, where we went through the process of going through the recommendations. But certainly it's something um, that we took into, ma into heart and um, something we uh, thought a lot about. And finally, um, US versus international. Most of the authors are US-based and thinking about US context, but we have three uh, co-authors who are from non-US settings. Mark, Mark Sculfer from the UK, David Feeney, and Murray Cron from Canada. Uh, we benefited enormously from their input. We thought a lot about um, what's going on uh, in non-US settings, and uh, we hope that the book has resonance elsewhere as well as in the US, as the first or well, the original panel's book did. Uh, just a, a note about external review. I mentioned uh, all chapters were reviewed by external experts in various fields. We posted the chapters for public comment in the fall of 2015, had many dozens of comments and revised uh, based on those and uh, grateful to those com for those comments. I also, also wanted to acknowledge Rebecca Gray, our technical editor extraordinaire. Um, as we say, um, uh, Becky really uh, improved the book in terms of its uh, clarity, consistency, the, the richness of the prose. Every page really uh, has Be Becky's uh, imprint on it. There's Becky at our Boston meeting. So uh, thanks, she's here somewhere. Becky, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks to, to Becky. <laughs> okay, so let me just um, close. I mentioned the JAMA book, uh, the JAMA article in the book. Um, just to orient you to the, uh, the book and really the day that we'll go through uh, various chapters. So we start with a chapter called Using CEA, defining terms, talking about things like cost effectiveness thresholds and what they mean, how to think about them, experiences that have uh, taken place since the original panel, and then on to theoretical foundations, uh, a dedicated chapter to the reference case, designing a cost effectiveness analysis, modeling and cost-effectiveness analysis, estimating consequences, valuing health outcomes, a chapter on costs, evidence synthesis, discounting, uncertainty, ethical considerations, reporting, and finally, uh, the two worked examples. My colleague David Kim, uh, first author of one of the uh, is here, thank you, and Ba Pham, the other uh, first author is not here, but uh, worked with Murray Cron at University of Toronto. Uh, four chapters are new, that is, they didn't appear in the original volume. Reference case, modeling, evidence synthesis, and ethical considerations. Certainly modeling, evidence synthesis, and ethical considerations were, were mentioned, highlighted, um, discussed throughout the original book, but we felt um, it was uh, dedicated chapters were warranted given all the work that's been done in those fields. And uh, the reference case, again, we thought a lot about, debated a lot about, and thought that would warrant its own chapter. Um, all the other chapters are um, considerably updated from the original volume. New references, a lot of new uh, ideas, and, and, and such. But that's the, uh, the book. And let me just then finish on today's agenda, and I'll introduce the speakers. So, um, first session, we'll talk about the key recommendations. Uh, then we're on to uh, a break, and then we come back and talk about the components of the cost-effectiveness ratio. Uh, then we have a discussion panel, the second panel's recommendations. We'll have lunch, um, come back because we have some great afternoon sessions designing, conducting, and interpreting cost-effectiveness analysis, um, policy considerations, and then a uh, real treat in the last session of the day, looking ahead, the next 20 years, we have uh, Milt Weinstein, Martha Gold, uh, and also Mike McGinnis and Mark McClellan on that panel. So stay around for the end. It's going to be great. Um, so with that, let me introduce um, the speakers for the first session. And I'll just 
show them all and introduce them and then ask them one by one to come up. I'm just going to do the very brief introductions. You have more on their bios in your packets. First, we have David Meltzer, who's the Fanny Pritzker Professor in the Department of Medicine and also the Harris School of Public Policy Studies, Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. Then we have Mark Sculfer, who's a professor at the Center for Health Economics, University of York. Then Jillian Sanders, Professor of Medicine at Duke. Uh, Louise Russell, Distinguished Professor at the Institute of Health and Department of Economics at Rutgers. And finally, Lisa Prosser, who's professor and director of the Child Health Evaluation Research Center, uh, Department of Pediatrics and Communicable, Communicable Diseases at the University of Michigan. So with that, um, thank you again for coming. And let me uh, call David Meltzer uh, up for the first session. Thanks. Thanks. It's, it's really a, a pleasure to, to be here and have a few minutes to talk to you. Um, Mark and I are both going to talk about the foundations and controversies. Um, and um, we, uh, along with um, Anurban Basu, I think the only three authors on the foundations chapter, I want to be sure I haven't forgotten anyone. Um, let me say that the, the theoretical foundations chapter um, is unusual in the context of the book because there were no recommendations. Um, all the other chapters really have recommendations. And one of the reasons we made that decision is we wanted to really um, provide a sense for the readers of some of the tensions um, and issues that get traded off in de developing cost-effective methods. And so in talking a little bit about the work that we did, I'm going to follow that and really describe a set of the tensions that I think were inherent in a lot of the discussions that we had um, as a panel. And in, in doing that, I also really want to give just incredible credit to both the co chairs and the other members of the committee, because there were some really heated disagreements, and sometimes very extended disagreements. And the group, I think, did an incredibly good job of, um, of actually working through them and, and staying incredibly civil. So that was great. So let me um, start with the, the first of these, which is Peter's already alluded to a little bit, the sort of tension between the role of theory on the one hand versus practical decision-making concerns. I think there were a few things we really agreed on that Cost effectiveness was a, a tool for maximizing something <laughs> that we desired and, and that, to figure out how to make good decisions subject to constraints to maximize those things. We also agreed that the scope of cost effective, if anything, was, was, was not just medical, but, but larger than that, public health, which the first panel had recognized. But even issues such as non-health spending that spill over into health or, or research were increasingly fair, fair game for these things. We also understood that um, cost effectiveness analysis had become a mix of, of conventions, things that are very widely used, like, like qualities, areas of, of variation, for example, how to measure quality of life, um, not just different methods for doing it, but even sometimes fundamentally different approaches, and also a series of, of controversies which, which sort of fester in a lot of ways, like distributional issues that are just really hard to uh, address in incredibly rigorous ways about, about what outcomes um, to measure. One of the areas where we saw greatest variation, in fact, some of the most difficult discussions were around which cost to consider. And I think one of the key reasons for this is that these were often tied to variation in the perspective that was being taken, often for a very practical nature, um, and, and, um, and, and reasons that differed um, across countries as well as settings. And so th sometimes these um, disagreements really had a big international component to them. One thing that I think we all agreed upon was that theory was really um, an important basis for cost-effectiveness analysis, but, but not the only one. Um, the theories could be diverse. There was a group of us, certainly, who were strongly rooted in economic theories and, and, and welfare economics. Obviously, measurement issues are strongly rooted in psychological theories. Um, and then, of course, ethical frameworks, which um, can include welfareism, but certainly a lot of extra welfareist perspectives. And so we all recognize that, that these were important. Um, in the chapter uh, the Theoretical Foundations, we also tried to spend a little extra time on, on some of the important ideas that had gained attention over the um, ensuing years since the prior um, report. Um, issues like net health benefits, which is, I, I will point out, the sort of most widely cited single new idea since the first um, panel. Um, future costs, and there will be more discussion about that later, and value of information analysis were all new ideas that really hadn't played um, as clearly in, in the first or all in some cases in the first panel's report. Another really big tension in the panel was the need to align analyses with purpose as opposed to um, sort of issues of, of comparability. 
And the, the need to align the analysis with purpose, often you know, embodied in perspective, but also sometimes conventions, suggests that you need the flexibility to assess costs and benefits as irrelevant to the decision maker or decision makers. And this really led to the recommendation for the impact table. We realized that many people could use cost effectiveness analyses even for a single decision, and that you needed to understand the effects on, on many um, individuals in order to um, make these the most valuable studies um, they could be. But we also recognize that another key purpose of cost effectiveness analysis and methods for cost effectiveness analysis is comparability uh, across the analyses. And um, this, the, and it is in fact this need for comparability as opposed to alignment with purpose that really is the key motivation for the reference case. And I will say that I don't think I appreciated that so fully even as a practitioner in the field until actually being on the panel. And, and once you understand that, these questions uh, about sort of what should we use a societal perspective or should we use a healthcare perspective or healthcare sector perspective, which we ended up recommending both, they become important because they're commonly valued perspectives, that they're good reference points. Not necessarily that one or the other is right in any one circumstance, but they're reference points. And it's around that that um, um, variation in methods become important. Now, Another set of concerns was practitioner burden, um, challenges in publication and accessibility and, of, of findings. And we um, were well aware that our recommendations, including multiple reference cases and the impact inventory, create a whole series of challenges. Added practitioner burden, challenges in how do you actually publish these things in journals that anyone reads, um, and accessibility of, of findings um, for, for, for readers. And so we spent a lot of time fighting about these, which of these reference cases to do and, and had a hard time agreeing to have actually two and an impact um, um, inventory because we were really concerned that this not be just some theoretical set of recommendations that no one really ever, ever followed. And this was, I think, our, 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 our best, um, our best you know, bad solution. <laughs> but I think it's a good one, actually. So let me target um, um, just a couple a couple of areas of ongoing controversy to, to mention. And I, I can't see these are the only ones you're going to hear many others over the course of the day, but they're the ones that um, I think um, had the most emotional valence for me as I look back on this. Um, one is sort of how to value non-health effects of, of, of policy. And we know there are a lot of very important non-health outcomes, how to educational outcomes for, for, for children, educational attainment, crime, others. The methods for these are very unclear, and yet we all recognize that um, they were important, and so they ended up, um, you know, playing um, roles in our recommendations. But they were they were areas that that challenged us. We also were challenged by the realization, and Mark's going to talk about this much more, that we needed a way to value the effects on budgets on non-health parts of government, that costs that were um, going to um, occur outside of health budgets might have different values than um, costs within the health budgets. And we weren't clear. Uh, there were not established methods that everyone was comfortable with about and accepted about how to do this. Some other areas, how to value effects on others. Um, one example of this is within the family, uh, especially through utility effects and altruism, but, but other effects as well. It's something I think we all recognize is important and actually played out not just on the utility side, but on the cost side um, as well. And then finally, distributional effects, which we all know are there. <laughs> um, we all are uncomfortable um, with the, um, the existence of existing solutions, um, and yet we know, know they're really important. So these were some of the areas that you know, were areas of active discussion. I hope this gives you some sense of sort of the flavor of the discussions we have. And um, you'll really hear about all these issues in the talks that come, including Mark's, which will follow now. Great. Thank you, David. Um, what I was, I've always saw, saw my role on the, uh, on the panel as being the, the lone European, or at least the lone European, I still consider myself a European, by the way, <laughs> despite what happened on 23rd of June. Uh, certainly the only European working in Europe uh, on the panel. And I guess that had something to do with the fact that in the UK, at least, um, we, we've tried to use it a bit in decision making. I think it's often overstated. Uh, even in the UK, how much cost effectiveness analysis is used. Um, the vast majority of resource allocation decisions in our health system do not, are not based on 
cost effectiveness analysis, but NICE has tried it and tried it quite extensively, not just around medical technologies, but also in public health and social care. Um, and they've, they've made errors. They've made, in my view, a lot of mistakes. They've done some really good stuff and some, and some less, uh, um, less uh, impressive things with cost effectiveness analysis. And, and I, I guess I, I hope to bring that to the table of the panel and, and, and reflect on some of the challenges of actually using this, uh, this set of tools um, uh, um, you know, real time to make real decisions, and and, and I I saw myself as needing to be a bit of a, a pain in the backside, to be quite honest. And some of those those arguments and debates we had that David referred to, I think may have been ones I caused. Um, but they, I think they, I, I I hope at least that they were productive ultimately. And I th I certainly think that out of those debates and discussions came some really uh, uh, useful insights as captured in the book. So I'm going to talk about two substantive areas um, of, of controversy sort of following on from what David's been talking about. But just to mention that I think in the period since the original panel, three areas in particular have really developed, um, and in large part um, through using these methods uh, with, in bodies like NICE, but also similar arrangements in Canada and Australia and elsewhere. The first is around evidence synthesis and the need to bring together all relevant evidence and to synthesize that when you don't, for example, have head-to-head -head trial data, so using methods like network meta-analysis. That's been a, a really important area of development and we have a new chapter in the book on that area. Modeling, decision analytic modeling has been ex used extensively um, by decision-making organizations who use cost-effectiveness analysis. Um, and important developments in that field, particularly around the role of individual sim level simulation, but also in infectious disease modelling. And we have a chapter, a new chapter on, on modelling, decision modelling. And then uncertainty analysis. Um, that's a, that was a, there was a chapter on uncertainty analysis in the original panel's work. Um, the, the new one is, is rather different. That too is an area that's developed rapidly over the last 10 years. Uh, methods like probabilistic sensitivity analysis and value of information methods. At least they are recommended by some decision making bodies who use cost effectiveness around the world. Whether they actually use them to make decisions, I think, is a moot point. But that was, a, that was an important area of development that hopefully is captured in, in the uncertainty analysis chapter. But the, the two areas where we had a most, most debate, and particularly this one, perspectives, um, I, what I want to talk a little bit more about. And I think um, this I found the most difficult, really, because um, the work that's gone, in, gone on certainly in the UK, um, where NICE's perspective has always been the system, the health system, which of course is a completely different system to the, those that operate in the US, um, but it brought it focused on this issue of who's making real decisions here. Um, and the concept of the societal perspective, I've always found most challenging because I don't know who the decision maker is. There is, in most systems, as far as I'm aware, no meta decision maker looking across, um, looking across different areas of resource allocation. But clearly, there's a strong case um, to consider all costs and benefits when we're doing analysis to inform decisions. The real problem I've had uh, throughout in the societal perspective is, is the idea that there is one societal perspective. Um, in principle, there are numerous perspectives, societal perspectives, uh, who, which would be characterized by which costs and benefits are included, how that those are valued, and importantly, how they're weighted and aggregated. I think we can agree that we can, we can, we can list and enumerate the different costs and benefits, uh, but bringing them together into single estimates is, is the most challenging um, aspect of that, and it, because it really hinges on this concept of a, society, of a social welfare function, the weights we put on different costs and benefits to different types of individuals. And in principle, there are uh, a million different types of social welfare function. And who decides that? Should it be analysts? Should it be us? Or should it be others? And indeed, could you ever get a consensus on something called a, a social welfare function? 
And we, these are the things that, that we debated long and hard. I think ultimately the contribution of the second panel around perspectives is firstly this idea of the impact table or impact inventory. That first and foremost, analysts should be explicit about where the costs and benefits fall. And secondly, the idea that coming up with one perspective is, is not, not ideal at all, certainly from a, the, from, from a viewpoint of consistency. And so even on the, in terms of a societal perspective, the book is very clear. There are a range of different approaches to that, but the need for transparency and explicit, explicitness is important. And then the second area that was a challenge in discussion and, and an ongoing challenge is around cost effectiveness thresholds. And in many ways, the book was, we sort of call, called it a day on the book um, whilst this, this sort of debate was happening and indeed still is happening, particularly in, in Europe, but I think it's, it's now uh, a particularly important debate in the US as well. And in the, in the UK, NICE has really struggled with this and NICE has an explicit thing it calls a cost effectiveness threshold. It's conceptually clear, NICE, is conceptually clear what it means by a threshold. It means something about opportunity costs. That is, what the system could, the benefits that could be achieved by devoting a resource to uh, another area of activity. So, in, for example, if a new drug costing a 10, 10 million to the system um, is introduced, where does that 10 million come from? What else could it be used for in the system? And what would the health effects of that 10 million uh, B. That underlies conceptually NICE's position on the threshold. Empirically, no, though, NICE has never really gone out and tried to measure it and has been criticised by a range of bodies in the UK and elsewhere, elsewhere for, do, for not doing so. But now there are methods for estimating that opportunity cost and that work has been done or, or is increasing internationally. The question is what relevance it has to the US. Um, and there were interesting debates um, about, well, I think these two issues that sometimes get conflated, which is how to, how to allocate existing resources within the system. So a system sort of envelope of resource, how best to allocate those resources to generate the greatest potentially uh, health, uh, population health improvement, versus the second issue, how to determine an appropriate level of resource in the first place. And in the UK, and I think in many other countries, in principle, it's, it's easier conceptually to keep those two questions separate. In the US, I think that's much more difficult. I think when we think about resource allocation in the US system, we think about those things together. And that, I think, has implications for how we think about this thing called a cost effectiveness threshold. That in principle, it's trying to do two things. And what's emerging in the, in the, in the literature now is this idea of a, a supply side cost effectiveness threshold, which some of us call health opportunity cost, which is basically how much the system is able to generate at the margin through additional expenditure. How productive is it at the margin? And that has implications for the question of how you allocate uh, existing resources, but also how much money should be put into healthcare in the first place. But then there's the demand side concept, which is more based on a sort of willingness to pay type idea, the, how much would individuals fund through taxation, insurance, personal out-of-pocket payments for improvements in their own health. And there is a long, of course, a long tradition of those types of uh, ways of thinking about the value of health and using those as cost-effectiveness thresholds. But if anything, they are informing decisions about the level of funding within the system rather than how you fund existing uh, um, the existing envelope of, envelope of resources. Now, these are all things that we give expression to in the book. Um, it's, it, the, 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 the jury is well and truly out on this type of work. It's really at the, cut, the boundary of where the field is. But I think there are two important contributions in, in the book with respect to cost effectiveness thresholds. Firstly, providing an overview of these different viewpoints about what thresholds are and how they might be empirically estimated. And secondly, I identify that this is a key policy area if we want to implement cost effectiveness analysis for real to inform real decisions. Thank you very much.
Um, so I get to talk about the reference case and the impact inventory, which you've already started hearing a little bit about. Before diving into that, I did want to just thank the whole panel. As, as Peter mentioned, um, you know, I think that we did a lot of work over the last four years. And to me, what amazes me is, is we ended the four years. I actually really think we all really still like each other. <laughs> I think um, I don't think everyone has started filtering my emails into a junk folder when they come to me to come from me, but. Uh, and I do want to, you know, Peter and I, I think over the four years, I think we worked incredibly well together in terms of balancing each other and, and taking the load when we had busy times and less busy times. And it has really been a, a pleasure working with this group of, of panelists. So with the reference case, um, as, as Peter mentioned, the original panel's recommendations were to have a reference case, which was really to set a standard methodological um, practice for cost effectiveness analysis and to, to follow that to improve the comparability and, and quality of the analyses. Um, they furthermore recommended that this reference case should take a societal perspective and that really should be the perspective of a decision maker whose intention is to make the decisions about the broad allocation of resources across the entire population. Um, and so the thought was that these the societal perspective would consider consider all parties that were affected by the intervention and count all the significant outcomes in terms of the benefits and costs um, that flow from it, regardless of who experienced those. And really the thought was that um, although this reference case would take the societal perspective, they could certainly address specific decision contexts as needed that might be from another perspective that was more relevant to their decision making. Um, now, since this, the, the 96 recommendation for the reference case, the experience, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, has been that many CEAs, most of them um, are not actually using the societal perspective. And that even when stating that they're using a societal perspective, there are often important elements that are omitted from that perspective. Um, for example, excluding time costs or costs outside of the health sector. Um, and then in addition, that decision makers that are actually using cost effectiveness analysis, and many of these, as um, Mark mentioned, are outside of the US, so within kind of Canada or Europe or Australia, that many of them um, have used cost effectiveness analysis to inform reimbursement decisions and have really, really taken a more focused perspective than that societal perspective. And so within the, um, the second panel's consideration, we debated about this a lot. And I think it was, um, I think it was actually our Miami in-person one where we spent the entire two days debating the perspective and went around and whether we were going to have one, whether, and, and you know, which one we were going to do and going back and forth. And you know, there really was the appeal of the societal perspective for many reasons. There was um, you know, the importance of it as a reference case it really reflects the broad public interest and we felt that was very important and, and, and really useful for decision makers to know. Um, but then there was concerns with the societal perspective. Um, you might, we might be seeing as, as disregarding what the revealed preferences were of actual decision makers, people that were really going to be using this to inform decision making if they were looking for a perspective that more reflected um, what goes into their decision making. And, and also, um, what, as Mark mentioned, what really goes into societal perspective is very unclear. Um, and so there are numerous ones, depending on what elements you really consider to represent uh, social value and how those elements are valued. Uh, we really wanted also to, to not lose the comparability of analyses um, and to making large changes, but wanting to make the, the recommendations from the second panel um, move the field forward and make it be that the analyses are used and useful to decision makers. So with that in mind, uh, we came up with our reference case recommendations. And here uh, we are recognizing um, the different preferences and needs um, of the different decision makers and we are recommending two reference cases. A reference case analysis based on a health sector perspective and then a second reference case based on a societal perspective. And so we are recommending that each analysis is performed from both of those perspectives. Um, we are again similar to the original panel recommending that you measure health effects in quality adjusted life years or qualities. And, and we're really thinking that these two reference cases are going to enhance the consistency and the comparability um, and the quality of the cost effectiveness analyses. Um, furthermore, for the, the health sector perspective, 
We recommend that the results should be summarized in an incremental cost effectiveness ratio, but that uh, net monetary benefit and net health benefit may also be reported. Um, kind of following on that controversy that Mark talked about with the cost effectiveness thresholds, uh, we recommend that a range of cost effectiveness thresholds should be considered. And then the impact inventory, and both Mark and uh, David started talking about this, one of the, the new recommendations within the second panel's book is, is the development and the inclusion of an impact inventory table. And this table is something that we want to use to list all the health and non-health impacts of an intervention. And really the main purpose of this is to ensure that all the consequences, including those outside of the formal health care sector, are considered comprehensively and, and discussed. Um, and we really want it to be a framework for organizing and thinking and presenting the different consequences. And actually, when, when we envision this being used, we envision it actually being used throughout the analytic process, both at the beginning of the, of the cost access analysis, when you're trying to determine what are the different components that you're going to be including in your analysis, and then downstream when you're actually presenting that to the, the audience and the stakeholders and the decision makers, showing them the different components and how you actually are incorporating them into your analysis. And so what I'm going to do here is actually step through the impact inventory table. And this is also in the, the JAM article that you have in your agenda to be able to see it in, in more uh, kind of be better, better size than up there. But I'm going to walk through the different components of this and hopefully orient people to how this is going to be used. Um, and I think that's actually really helpful for those um, as you start to implement this is seeing how these are incorporated in into the two worked examples that are available in the book to really see how we um, have this play out within a, an actual analysis. So within the impact inventory, there are several columns. Um, they show, the first column shows the different sectors and we'll walk through where, what those different sectors are. The second uh, column is the types of impact. Um, within each of the sectors, both the effects and costs of, in each of those sectors. And then there's a, a third column where there's really a checklist for inclusion and exclusion and, and demonstrating which things you are actually included in things in your analysis from the health sector perspective and then the societal perspective. There's certainly from the healthcare sector perspective um, a set, a set of, of impacts that we are, you know, saying are suggested or required to be included in that perspective. From the societal perspective, there's you know, a much wider range of things that could be included. And there, that's where we want the analyst to be um, checking off what is included in their societal perspective. There's then a final column where you would have um, some additional notes or sources of evidence and, and details that would be helpful to the, to the reader. Um, and then along with the rows, we have different sections. So the top section is the formal healthcare sector, and these are the ones that are all these different components are included within the healthcare sector perspective analysis. We then have two other um, areas. One is the informal healthcare sector. So this is things like patient time costs, unpaid caregiver time costs, and transportation costs. And then the non healthcare sectors. And so these are things such as productivity, consumption, uh, the social services, the legal or criminal justice se sector, education, housing, environment, and other sectors. And so really wanting to make sure that when we're talking about um, health interventions and the impacts that those have on society, that we're not just looking at the impacts to the patient or their family or, or um, uh, you know, that, that limited um, impact, but really seeing how are these actually impacting the other sectors and, and truly having a societal perspective. Um, and then for each type of impact, either a, a cost or effect, this table is used to have a checkbox indicating whether it's included in the reference case from a specific uh, perspective. And so, you know, here for those, these are things in the healthcare sector, and so these are actually included in both the healthcare sector and societal perspectives. But then as we move down um, the, the, to the other sectors, these would be things that would not be included within the healthcare sector perspective, but are included within the societal. And then for the non-healthcare sector uh, rows there, you know, some of them um, included in the societal, but other ones not. And we would hope that the kind of the notes column is where you would make some indication about uh, why things were or were not included and, and kind of the orders of magnitude of, of 
those decisions. Um, one thing also to note, and I think this is actually in one of our worked examples, so this is, these impact inventory really focuses on a healthcare sector and the societal perspective. Certainly if there's another perspective that's important to your decision maker, you could have another column. I think one of our worked examples actually has the patient perspective and so has a third column there as well. I'm going to turn it over to Louise now. You can see that while both the first and the second panel agreed that the societal pers perspective was important, the second panel did a lot more thinking about what's actually involved in defining a societal perspective, what needs to be looked at, what needs to be measured. Um, and that's, I'm going to talk about how far we were able to get with that, because we were able to make some progress with it, but we weren't able to come up with a complete answer to how should we handle a societal perspective. I think the one thing that everybody agrees with, I hope I'm not overstating this, about the societal perspective is that it does mean considering everybody who's affected and every way in which they might be affected, unless those are really minor effects. So we're agreed on something like the impact inventory. People felt that the impact inventory was a really good idea. It was a way to get people to start thinking more rigorously, more routinely, about what's involved in making healthcare decisions. <clears throat> and especially in the United States, where we're closing in on spending one out of every five dollars on medical care, it's important to think not just about the impacts on health and the healthcare sector, but the impacts outside of the healthcare sector. So the main purpose of the impact inventory was to ensure that all of these consequences, including those outside the formal healthcare sector, are considered routinely and comprehensively. And we have that list there to help people think about that. There may be other items that should be added to it, but we've gone a long way towards um, creating a list that will help people think, all right, have I considered this possibility? And it provides a framework for organizing and thinking about and presenting these various types of consequences. As cost-effectiveness analysts, of course, then we're used to making two additional steps. We don't want just to list these things and say, yes, we thought about them. We want to measure them. And then we want to try to value them in some way that the final step lets us summarize them. And as we moved down that path, it got harder and harder to reach agreement. And I think David and, and Mark have helped lay the foundations for why it's so hard to reach agreement on that. There's still a lot of thinking and a lot of discussion there. Recommendation 3B deals with the easier part of this, which is after you've decided that your, the intervention you're looking at has certain important effects, you ought to try to quantify them. This may take you into areas you're not familiar with. You may need to call in some experts that are not the usual kind of experts you deal with in cost-effectiveness analysis because you're dealing with crime reduction or you're dealing with educational attainment. And these are not subjects that cost-effectiveness analysts are familiar with, by and large. So you should try to measure them. And if possible, you should try to value them in some fashion. And usually that means we've got two ways of valuing things in cost-effectiveness analysis, the quality-adjusted life year and the costs. So it usually means you either want to try to value it um, as part of the quality-adjusted life year, or you want to try to value it as part of the costs so that you can get to some kind of summary measure. So recommendation 3B just says you should attempt to quantify, and notice the attempt to, quantify and value non-health consequences in the impact inventory unless those consequences are likely to have a negligible effect on the results. Recommendation 3C, Mark and David have described some of the tensions and arguments we had. Recommendation 3C was the focus of a lot of arguments. It's where a lot of those foundational issues came home and we had to decide, all right, we've got this table. We've recommended that everybody consider these things um, in their analysis. We've recommended that they try to quantify them and that they try to value them. Let's suppose they succeed in quantifying them and valuing them. Can they summarize them? And if so, what should we recommend in terms of a summary? And we all agreed it would be helpful, at least we thought it would be helpful to decision makers if we could summarize the results of such an analysis. We're used to doing that 
in a standard cost effectiveness analysis. We use either the incremental cost effectiveness ratios to summarize results. We use net monetary benefit to summarize results. So we're used to doing that. We're used to viewing this as a very helpful item rather than simply handing the decision maker a table and saying, here's a table for this intervention and here's a table for that intervention and now try to make up your mind. Um, but to try to summarize it in a way that can help focus attention on what the decision maker needs to think about in choosing among these interventions. So we agreed that it would be helpful and recommendation three starts by saying that it would be helpful to try to summarize the results in some way. But then we ran into disagreement and into uncertainties about whether we knew enough to get further than that. Um, recommendation 3C goes on and says, there are no widely agreed on methods for quantifying and valuing some of these broader effects in cost effectiveness analyses. So then we had to sort of step through, all right, what should you do with the impact inventory then? Definitely, you should use it to focus your analysis. Definitely, you should use it to identify things that you should be looking at and you should take seriously to determine whether they are an important part of your analysis. Definitely, you should present those considerations in the form of the impact inventory, either in the article or in the technical appendix, preferably in the article, but if the editors don't give you enough space in the technical appendix for your article. Um, and there you will say, yes, we consider all of these things. These are important. These we were able to quantify. Some of these we were able to value. It took a lot of discussion to reach the rest of this recommendation. We were unable to reach agreement on a single summary measure. And I think, again, what David and, and Mark have said about the different possible ways of of thinking about the societal perspective and different possible decision makers trying to make use of the societal perspective information um, makes it clear why it might be difficult to come up with a single summary measure. We'd like to do that. We're used to doing that. But we're not sure that we can do that here. So what we recommended, this is really kind of a step towards the next time somebody sits down and thinks hard about cost effectiveness analysis and um, how it should be, what sorts of updates to these recommendations there should be. We recommended the analysts try to summarize that they might use one or more summary measures, either the incremental cost effectiveness ratio and or net monetary benefit or net health benefit that includes some of the items in the impact inv inventory. We left a lot of analyst discretion there. You might try several different ones. You might try everything in the impact inventory. You might try if you're already presenting information from the healthcare sector perspective, and that's some of the information in the inventory, and you might add some of the others, and then you might try all of them. But we did not um, specify a single summary measure that is, should be the result of an impact inventory. Instead, we said that analysts should clearly identify which items are included, how they're measured and valued, and provide a rationale for the way they did the measuring, the valuation, and the summarizing. So I would, um, we still have then a need for some kind of framework on which we can read con reach consensus. There were various frameworks put forward among the panel members, but there wasn't a single framework that earned the agreement of everybody on the panel. So going forward, it would be desirable if we can find such a thing to find a general framework that describes the links among the, thing, the items in the impact inventory. Some of the issues that come up, for example, is are all of these items on the same level in the sense that if we are focusing on health, as we do in cost effectiveness analysis, and using qualities as our measure of health, are some of these products of health? And are we therefore possibly double counting some things when we count products of health as well as health? Um, which things? If, the, if, there, if this is a problem, which of these things has this, which of these items have this problem and which do not? So it's still a job for the future to develop a framework, if such a framework is possible, which corresponds to the structure of the impact inventory and suits most analyses. And I think some of Mark's remarks suggested that it might not be possible because of the different foci, foci of decision makers. At the same time, um, he and, and David both brought out that the social perspective can 
exist independently of decision makers and can inform their decisions even if they're not making the decision from that point of view. They have their own budget, they have their own audience, they have their own clientele, but it is good for them to know all of these other effects that they may or may not take directly into account in their decision. And the impact inventory is designed to do that. So in the meantime, the panel's recommendation 3C, which I've just given you, um, advises analysts to present both summary and disaggregated measures of costs and health outcomes, but it stops short of recommending a single summary measure. And next up is Lisa. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to start by also um, acknowledging and thanking the leadership group for shepherding us through this process over the last few years. And also to um, take a moment to also acknowledge our external reviewers whose thoughtful comments really influence not just the reporting guidelines, but many of the other guidelines that we'll be talking about today. So the original panel emphasized the importance of appropriately reporting the results of cost effectiveness analyses. And our updated recommendations continue to emphasize the importance of clear reporting for ensuring transparency, completeness, and comparability. Overall, the goal of the reporting recommendations is to help authors communicate meaningful information about the value of an intervention and where the impacts are greatest across sectors and target populations. And the key updates to the 2016 recommendations include a structured abstract format, the use of an impact inventory, and the reporting of intermediate and disaggregated outcomes, which we've already heard some about. And I'll provide a few more details on the next slides. So the updated recommendations include a structured abstract format to support all three objectives, providing transparency, ensuring completeness, and allowing for comparability. And while we hope that more journals will adopt a structured abstract format for cost effectiveness analyses, we recognize that most journals do not currently have this. In this case, we recommend that analysts incorporate the elements from the structured abstract format into the required format for a particular journal. So this slide shows a quick example of how, the, uh, how to adapt the recommended reporting elements into a structured abstract format. And the elements that are underlined include those that are new or have received more attention and reflect the new chapters in the updated guidelines. For example, an abstract should specify whether the reference case perspectives included both the healthcare sector and societal perspectives were included, were any other perspectives included, such as a payer perspective or alternative, because as Louise has just gone through, there could be various combinations of the elements and the different sectors that were included and listed in the impact inventory, and these should be highlighted here as much as possible. Study design should state the modeling approach and other details as appropriate. And the updated definition of a basic set of results will include, along with the ICER, a measure of the robustness of the results to changes in parameter inputs, model structure, or other sources of uncertainty. And we'll hear more about measures of uncertainty in later sessions today. Since the original panel's report, a number of checklists for the reporting of cost effectiveness analyses have been released. And we considered adopting an existing checklist. But given the introduction of the impact inventory and the updated reference cases, we elected to revise the existing reporting checklist to include these additions, as well as the other key changes in the guidelines. Some of these other changes include additional specification of the modeling methods and results, additional emphasis on design and scope, including the reference case perspectives. The checklist also includes elements on information on data sources, evidence synthesis methods, and an overall critique of the quality of the data to reflect a guidelines from the new chapters on evidence synthesis and modeling. And while adherence to reporting guidelines has improved since the original panel recommendations in many areas, the reporting of adjustments for health-related quality of life remains an important area of opportunity for improved reporting. In a recent review of published CEAs, as many as one third of papers did not report the source for quality adjustments. In these guidelines, we recommend that analysts report the elicitation method, so either direct or indirect, the elicitation task or measurement system, and if the weights represent community-based preferences or not. <coughs> 
there is an increased emphasis on the intermediate and disaggregated outcomes. And given that cost effectiveness analysis is uh, rarely used explicitly in decision making in the US context, the reporting of intermediate outcomes, such as the number of cases, adverse events, or complications, hospitalizations, or deaths, can often represent crucial information for decision makers, especially when these outcomes, uh, when these outcomes are projected at the population level. And the inclusion of intermediate outcomes can often help users who are less familiar with cost effectiveness analysis to assess the quality and the accuracy of the modeling approach and improve their confidence in the modeling results. And it's important to note that the set of reference case results is defined to include not just the ICERs, but the disaggregated costs and outcomes and should include one or more measures of uncertainty. And as someone who's worked closely with CDC and other federal decision makers who are considering cost effectiveness evidence, this can be a critical way for users to evaluate the validity of the model. And the disaggregated outcomes can refer to both costs and quality adjusted life years. Users may be interested in different types of costs, such as medical care, out of pocket, or they could be interested in the composition of the quality adjusted life years, really understanding where those health benefits were derived from. For example, gains in qualities may be offset by side effects or adverse events and the magnitudes of these offsets. So we've heard earlier about the overall purpose of the impact inventory. I'd just like to re-emphasize the role of the impact inventory for reporting. So first, we strongly recommend that journals request and authors submit the impact inventory for all submitted CEAs. And I know we have representatives from editorial boards of journals here today. Um, even for analyses that only include impacts in the healthcare sector, the reporting of the impact inventory provides a clear and transparent method for communicating the bounds of the analysis. So clearly identifying which impacts are included, allowing for the identification of effects in other sectors, even if they're not included explicitly in the analysis. Um, some examples outside of the formal healthcare sector could include time costs for patients or caregivers, cost of special education, or home modifications needed to accommodate a, uh, accommodate a physical condition. But there may be other impacts, as we heard about, uh, changes in crime or uh, changes in levels of educational attainment that may not be valued and incorporated into the analyses but would be included in the impact inventory. And we do recognize that due to space limitations, it may not be feasible to include the inventory in the journal article, but that this table would play a key part of a role in the technical appendix to the analysis. So I've not listed all of our uh, 12 reporting recommendations here, but have just highlighted a few that included key changes. Um, so the, for recommendation number two, and again, I haven't um, included the full text of the recommendations here. You'll have to go to the book for those, uh, but uh, we'd like to highlight key changes to a few recommendations. So for recommendation number two, the updated guidelines continue to recommend that the summary report or journal article be accompanied by a technical appendix so that sufficient details are available that the interested reader could replicate the analysis if they so desired. And these supplementary materials can range from one or more tables to a complete standalone technical manual, depending on the complexity of the analysis. The impact inventory is viewed as an essential component of this technical appendix. For recommendation number three, the use of a structured abstract or the elements of a structured abstract format is highlighted to improve comparability and transparency across analyses. And recommendation number seven, which lists the components of the basic set of CEA results, and I haven't included all the components here, but in addition to total costs, total effectiveness, incremental costs, incremental effectiveness, and ICERs, the updated recommendations also include the reporting of intermediate health outcomes, disaggregated results, and a measure of robustness to reflect uncertainty. And these additional metrics really reflect that CEA in the US context is used as an input to overall decision making. These aspects of the analysis can have important bearing on decision making separate from the cost effectiveness ratio. <coughs> So overall, the reporting recommendations continue to support the goal of providing transparency through the structured abstract format, the reporting checklist, the impact inventory, and technical appendix, and the additional reporting of intermediate outcomes and disaggregated results. And the report of the CEA should be designed to communicate all important features of the analysis, as well as to highlight any aspects of the study that are unusual or unexpected. We've also included some new guidance on reporting conflicts of interest. So the recommendations regarding the structured abstract format and checklist help to ensure completeness both for users and for reviewers. 
And using these tools will provide for additional comparability across analyses. And the clear reporting of a cost-effectiveness analysis can potentially increase the likelihood that analysis will truly inform clinical or policy decisions. In our discussions among the panel and updating the reporting recommendations, we also identified some key areas for future clarification. And going forward, it will be important to think about new ways that we can try to um, share even more information about aspects of the analysis. So thinking of ways of sharing models, sharing data, I know that some journals are experimenting with approaches for actually model sharing and data sharing um, to support um, publications. New formats for presenting results. Are there ways that we can take advantage of emerging technology to communicate results, such as using interactive displays for cost effectiveness and other results from the analyses? And we look forward to uh, more research in these and many other areas. And I'll pause here and turn things back over to Peter. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa, and all the panels. I'll ask the panelists, uh, the speakers rather, in the first session to come up, if you would, and put on your mics and make sure you turn them on. Um, so we have about 30 minutes or 25 minutes, whatever, for questions. We have two mics in the room. And let me also say for all of you listening in uh, on the webcast, you um, are certainly invited uh, to submit questions online, and we will try to take those uh, as well. So. Um, let me also say, the way we've structured this day is we have three formal sessions, call them, with slides, and uh, then we have three discussion sections where we have no slides, but just have, we'll have uh, sort of roundtable uh, discussions. So um, I don't see anybody wanting to be the first speaker, so think about your questions, and maybe I'll, I'll start. Um, I have, sorry? Yeah, so yeah, if you have a question, come to the mic. So maybe some of you do. We have two mics here. Um, so let me start. I have a number of questions, but um, <laughs> I, I, and I haven't told them in advance, but <laughs> I'm going to pick on you, Mark, first. And I just thought it might be interesting in the, you know, the spirit that sometimes it takes an outsider to really help you think about um, what you're doing. You came to this process with experience from the UK and NICE and such. and. Having served on the panel and the U.S. panel, in a sense, in the last couple of years, any sort of high-level reflections you might uh, give us? I wish you had warned me about that question. Um, <clears throat> well, I, you know, I, I mean, the first thing to say is how much I enjoyed it. I have to say, it was it really was a very enjoyable, and it, but ref, but it also highlighted to me just this thing we call cost-effectiveness analysis um, can be put together in any number of different ways. Um, and I hadn't really appreciated how, you know, how, how many different viewpoints you can take on, a, on, on what appears to be a homogeneous toolkit. Um, and I think um, it, when you're developing guidelines, reference cases, if you like, for particular decision makers with particular remits, um, um, that are often, those remits are often written down, the, the, the task is a whole lot more straightforward than when you're trying to pull together a much more general set of recommendations to be used by a whole range of different decision makers in different contexts, even within a single country. You know, I, I think we did a really good job in that, but it's, it is a, the magnitude of the task, for those of you who um, have been involved as I have, for, in developing system type guidelines for particular decision making, it's a completely different task to try and generalize those across systems and across, across decision makers. Okay, great. Uh, John, if you go to the mic, please. And if you would, introduce yourself and give your affiliation. <coughs> Thank you so much uh, for both the publication and very edifying explication. The book is still sitting on my nightstand uh, next to my bed, so this was a great uh, yeah. introduction. Yeah, speak into the mic if you would. We just yeah, uh, John O'Donnell with Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, just two questions. One, I think it's Luis, but um, the framework and the general framework, it was a little bit abstract when you were describing it. Um, you know, as the social scientist in me was thinking about a path diagram where these kind of constructs interrelate, but I don't think that's exactly where you were going. So maybe you could unpack that a little bit more. And then Mark, uh, nice to see you again. Um, MCDA did not make it in, um, and I just want to hear a little bit of discussion about, um, you know, why kind of quality, hard and fast, and maybe net monetary benefits. So if you could expand on those two opportunities, I'd appreciate it. Sure. 
Um, yes, I think that something like a path diagram would be a next step, and trying to find agreement on it would be, I mean, in a sense, we did talk about several alternative path di diagrams, but people had di different path diagrams in their heads and didn't agree that there was a single one. Um, I, I kind of alluded to that when I said that some of the things that are included in the inv impact inventory were viewed by some of us as possibly being the products of health and maybe we shouldn't count them again and viewed by other people as, yes, of course, they're, they may be the products of health, but we should still count them. So I think there is a path diagram that probably needs to be thought through or several path diagrams and then a good deal of discussion about what those path diagrams represent and whether it is possible to come to a single one. Does that get a little bit more at what you had in mind? Okay, and Mark? Yeah, just, just briefly. Uh, I think MCDA is one of those things that means different things to different people. Um, and I, I guess we didn't see it as a primary task of, of the panel to provide a, an explanation, um, a taxonomy for all the different approaches and, uh, that are being used in the field at the moment or being uh, uh, suggested for use. Um, I think this is an area that's developing very rapidly. Um, ISPOR have recently undertaken two, two task forces around <coughs> MCDA. I think it's still finding its place. So maybe this is something for the next, uh, the next panel to take on. To be yeah, and, and just another note on that. I'm looking at Murray Cron in the audience here. We'll talk later. We did discuss MCDA, MCD, multi-criterion decision analysis. Um, in the first chapter where we talk about experiences using CEA, we do uh, have a brief discussion and certainly have recognized it as an area for future research as well. So why don't we go over here? Yep. Good morning, John Glass, Paul Shire. Thank you very much for a fantastic panel and a, a fantastic report. The question I had was, we see the US ISA group have budget impact combined with their cost effectiveness analysis. Was that discussed during the session as to be appropriate or other factors during the uh, development of the guidelines? I think it, it certainly came up in discussion around what are called cost effectiveness <laughs> thresholds. Because one, you know, one perspective on, on th that is that your cost effectiveness threshold should modulate according to the size of the impact on the budget. Um, but, uh, but again, that's sort of something that's developing in, in the methods of literature <coughs> around now. And although it's given some reflection and discussion in the book, it's not, arguably, it's not the right time to define that precisely and be prescriptive about it. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, well, let me add one other thing. I, I think one of the areas where there was definite discussion was sort of magnitude of benefit, and that's where, for example, the net health benefit framework has a clear benefit. And so I, I think the scale of the effect was something that probably we didn't talk about as much as we should in terms of effect on budget, but we did certainly talk about the, the, the concept that there were budgets and there were, there were issues around opportunity costs in budgets. I think one of the most difficult areas for us to kind of come to a common understanding about, if we came to one, was about the mutability of budgets. There were a variety of theoretical frameworks that argued that budgets were fixed and that therefore they had opportunity costs, and there were other theoretical frameworks that argued that resources were mutable across budgets so that there were common opportunity costs. And um, that was as much a difference of philosophy and um, speculation as anything else, but it was a, it was a big discussion. Okay, yeah, thank just you. One other, sorry, John. No, thank you very much. Just one other kind of historical note on this. Some of the new value frameworks, ICERS framework, for example, at least its new version of it, um, is a more recent phenomenon. Most of the book was written in 2014, 15, and so things were certainly happening during this time period, but some of the more recent developments are just not uh, in the book because we couldn't okay. get them. Thanks, Peter. Um, I was told um, there's some static, and all of you should turn off your phones because that may be part of the problem. <laughs> So if you could do that. Charlie. I'm uh, Charleston, Columbia, South Carolina. In uh, 1998 in JAMA, I wrote a paper with Rob Gallo about conflict of interest in pharmaceutical-sponsored economics. And we updated that paper recently using your database. And you also have a similar paper that you've published on the big, rosy, on the big synthesis. My question is, now that this has come out, do you think that going forward we'll see less of that kind of concern than we had in the past? Well, I, others, maybe uh, in particular Lisa on the reporting chapter, I, I think um, 
conflict of interest, potential bias is an ongoing concern, probably always will be, and we need to have policies for disclosure uh, and others. We, we do have a panel later with Rob Golub of JAMA, uh, John Wong, who's an associate editor of Annals, and so we really wanted to have journal editors here as part of this discussion, so I would also, if, I, if we don't remember to have them address that uh, as well, but it's certainly a good point. Any, anything else from I anyone? Just one yeah. other comment. Yeah. There's a related concept, which is that of just interest. In other words, incentives. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that this is one of the areas where what we did is a really big move forward. Because depending on your perspective as a decision maker and, and how you approach what you think of as your goals, you can get completely different uh, um, conclusions about the value of something. A managed care organization that has a payoff, you know, two, five, ten, twenty, thirty years from now, and and I, you know, I think conflict of interest is really important, but I think that interest is probably an order of magnitude more important issue, and one that was not, I think, really captured by any of the frameworks fully, and, and certainly not ours either. Although it, 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 I think, it lays open the, the 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 challenge to justify why you're taking the perspective you are, and and I I, I think that's really important. Just one last thing I want to say about that is. I think that our recommendation about the impact table is only as good as the reviewers and journal editors who, who look at these papers. And, and you know, I, I think the, the onus is on all of us to ask, are people really answering a meaningful question someone is going to care about? And, and, and which questions and for whom? And I am sure that there are going to be all sorts of challenges for authors and for editors in figuring out how to, how to deal with this. Because only so much is going to go in a paper, but uh, you know, in, in, you know, U.S. health policy has changed notably within the past couple of weeks, right? And um, um, and, and and those those sort of changes in policy have implications for what relevant means, and and so I think we have a lot of work to do as a community to use these guidelines well. And Louise, you're an editor at MDM. Yeah. Um, I absolutely agree that peer reviewers and editors have an important role here. One of the purposes of recommendations like these that isn't usually said out loud, but it is there, is to help people who are evaluating cost-effectiveness analyses know whether everything's been included and done the right way. And that's an attempt to get around this issue of bias. The bias and the incentives for bias will always be there, but if we have some kind of standards, a good analysis must include this, must include that, must do this in this way, it helps to reduce the effects of that bias. Great. Brian. Hi, I'm Brian Luce uh, from a um, number of places, Evadera and University of Washington and my own little company. Um, so um, first of all, congratulations. This is wonderful. I know how hard it is to do what you did. Um, uh, and it's, um, it's, it's clearly going to be um, a great next step of um, evolution here. I, I have several questions, uh, one of which just follows from uh, what you were just um, um, mentioning. As far as the inventory is concerned, was there any consideration given to the level of importance of um, items? Um, I was struck years ago um, in ADHD, um, whereby the level of the, the, the importance uh, outcomes are often educational and you know, societal kind of uh, impact issues, um, but yet the analyses would be normally focused in the healthcare system. Um, an inventory that simply identifies that there are educational issues without identifying the importance of it relative to others um, it would be useful. And was that ever taken into consideration? The second question, has to do with reaching out to stakeholders. I just spent the last couple of years or, um, at PCORI, and everything revolves around starting with stakeholders and bringing them in and asking them what they want and what they need and so forth. And I was wondering the degree to which um, you, you did um, reach out to uh, um, payers and um, decision makers, and maybe even patients. Um, um, and, and in the case of editors, I mean, we have editors here, but did you talk with editors ahead of time as to what they needed and what they would do and so forth? And the other part, and I may have taken a, a mental break while you were talking, but I didn't hear the issue of future healthcare costs. 
um, which flagged to me uh, when I read the JAMA article. And um, I would imagine that would have been quite an issue in your discussions. I'd like to hear what you have to say about those as well. Okay, great. So three issues. The importance of items in the impact inventory, outreach to stakeholders, and future costs. So why don't we take one at a time. The importance of items in the impact inventory. Yeah. Jillian? So we certainly talked about that a lot. And I think really the, um, the column, the, the, the notes there is an area there where uh, you can put some information about the magnitude of those effects or especially for explaining when things are not included in the impact inventory. We certainly, um, you know, because we talked a lot about what, you know, whether we should have a checkbox, whether we should be putting what the kind of units of analysis are, whether we should actually be putting some actual findings in there. Um, we really wanted it in the end to be kind of an organizational table that then is supported by the text within the main article and, and the technical appendix. And so certainly um, discussions of the order of magnitude of some of those different effects that you include or not include is a really important part of this, the supporting text, um, but just not everything could get into the impact inventory table. I don't know if there's anything else, Lisa, from your perspective. No, I was just going to comment. Uh, yeah, that speak up. I think we might have some audio issues. So, so. that, um, you know, we did go back and forth that we had several versions of the original impact inventory that laid out in great detail the units costing out you know, each of the different impacts, both thinking about both costs and potential benefits, not necessarily restricted to health, but even beyond health. Um, but in terms of tractability, we're concerned that that would really limit the use of the inventory. And so again, those, that's information that can be included in the notes, can be included in the analysis, did not end up in the final impact inventory. And that's partly um, you know, in response to where we did hear comments from our thoughtful external reviewers. And the, where we incorporated that. Great, so um, let's move on. Stakeholders, anyone want to say something? Maybe I'll just say, yeah. Well, I was gonna say, I mean, we yeah. certainly talked about that a lot in terms of um, how to reach out to stakeholders. I mean, one thing that we, we and we didn't, we didn't kind of at the beginning go out to different stakeholders and say, you know, what, what do you need to be making your decision making? So we didn't do that kind of like a, a Corey uh, key informant type of thing. We did um, certainly reach out to a lot of those stakeholders during the external review process. We're reaching out to specific organizations and groups and trying to get their um, information in that context and incorporate there, but it obviously was a kind of downstream in the process. I don't know if you... No, I, I just say there is certainly a sensitivity that this is or could be an academic exercise and that perhaps we're not talking to uh, decision makers enough and stakeholders enough. So uh, I just uh, agree, the, the public posting of chapters, and we tried to widely publicize that. We had a lot of comments from very different places. You asked about journal editors, some of the reviewers on the chapters, I'm thinking of Mike Drummond of Value and Health, and John Wong I mentioned, and others, uh, editors. So we certainly tried to be sensitive to it and reach out. Um, future cost, David, I, I can think yeah. of no one better than you to yeah, um, tell us so, about so, that. Um, we mentioned it very briefly in this beginning, but you're going to hear a lot more of it from Honor Bond. I think the, the key thing to understand is that when the first panel's report was coming out, the key papers in this area were literally just coming out in real time. And so they made, um, I think, you know, recommendations that balanced the ambiguity that was present at that point. I think there's a lot more clarity at this point, and, and that's reflected both in the recommendations about the societal perspective, um, where there are, there are issues around both uh, medical costs and non-medical costs, and in the, the healthcare sector perspective, where there are a variety of effects on healthcare costs that are related to both related and unrelated illnesses. And so those are, I think, pretty clear in the recommendations, and I think Honor Bond will talk about them a little more in his recommendations. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone, Ankur Pandya, Harvard. Um, the panel, it just reminds me of like the US basketball team in 1992, there was the original dream team, and in 1996 there's a second, and there's debate about which one's better, so thank you all. Um, <laughs> Only no good pro contracts. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my question is, it's a follow-up question to, to a question that Milt had uh, at SMDM meeting uh, in, in Vancouver in October, which was about comparability of reference cases, and specifically the societal case. So if someone adhered to the original panel's societal uh, uh, perspective reference case, uh, and then if uh, you know, a researcher now adheres to the new panel's uh, societal perspective reference case, the incremental ratios are not necessarily comparable. And so if there's a researcher that wants to use the Tufts cost-effectiveness registry and look at these ICERs, um, 
the question I have is, how does the panel uh, recommend thinking about this comparability issue? And can you speculate on, given the changes in the new societal case in particular, you know, sh should we expect like a shift? Everything's now going to look a little more cost effective if we include productivity costs or maybe the other direction or we don't know. And so what do we do about all that? Louise. Um, I think the answer to that is that what has been done in the literature for the last 20 years is really the healthcare perspective. And so as long as people present both a healthcare perspective and a societal perspective, there will be a point of comparability between the older literature and the newer literature. It's the healthcare perspective. Even when people said they were doing the societal perspective, they were really doing the healthcare perspective. In fact, they kind of defined it for us. Um, so what we're trying with this new one is, with the new definition of the societal perspective, the new more detailed definition of the societal perspective, is to get to th them to think about it more seriously, to go beyond what they have been doing as the standard, the healthcare sector perspective. I don't think it'll lead to a lack of comparability because as I say, the healthcare sector perspective can serve for that. Yeah. I just, just one other point on this. I, I do think the, one of the key contributions here is a call for more clarity around perspective. And um, at the very least, in the future, if someone puts a ratio out or puts a league table together, there should be clarity uh, about the perspective for each analysis. Um, there probably is a bit of a downside in terms of comparability with previous analyses, but as Louise says, most probably haven't been doing a societal perspective. The, the other point to make is we, we can certainly, and we, we intend to track um, comparability going forward. So we'll look at what people are doing going forward. We have the ability with the Tufts registry, as you mentioned, to look back, and so that's a future analysis we'll do. Um, yeah, so why don't we go here and then to you, Joe. Yeah. Hey, um, Sally Stearns, University of North Carolina. <clears throat> I want to thank the panel for a fantastic effort. And I, in particular, I really actually love the uh, impact inventory table. But I'm also looking at it as an educator and thinking of the students that I work with. And I can see them all going, I'm going to do the healthcare sector and then do lip service to the extent that they do the societal. So what I'm wondering is, and I think the societal perspective is very important. So what can we do as educators, both with working with training um, future researchers, and also, I guess, keeping funders and policy makers focused on the societal perspective. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Julian, David. Yeah, I mean, I think, and, and you know, and we actually, we were very close to just recommending the healthcare sector perspective. I mean, I mean, I think we actually had a brief moment where that was our recommendation, and then we we felt uncomfortable with that, with with dropping the societal perspective. I think that it will be important to for for students for us to have some. Um, actual work examples or cases where there are differences in the recommendations or the kind of what's coming out of the analyses from the health sector and the societal, societal perspective to be able to show those to students and demonstrate to them the importance of looking at a different perspective. And, and, and I think that, so as we move forward and we have more and more kind of <coughs> to, to point to, I think as an educator, um, having those examples and being able to demonstrate to them why doing this additional perspective would actually bring more, kind of help inform decision making differently. So I, I think that will be something that we help the women Okay, David and then Lisa. And yeah, I, I think I wanted to say basically the same thing, but with a slightly different emphasis, which is again to sort of the reviewers and the journal editors. It's all about what you conclude. Right. So if you can, if you say that from the perspective of the healthcare system sector, this is a good thing, um, th and that's your conclusion. Fine, if if but that doesn't mean it's a good thing in general, or it doesn't mean we should do it, right? And there are a bunch of other things that we haven't think, thought about, and because of that, I can't tell you what to do. <laughs> and 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 so I, I I think that's really critical, and I think it's an area we fall down again and again and again in this field. And and so I I really hope that people will come to conclude that their chance of getting a paper published if they only do one of these is dramatically diminished. But again, the onus is on us. So very quickly, Lisa. Add to that, that I mean, the one exception when we were having this discussion. Oh, can't hear you. Oh, sorry. So the one, the one exception.
misconception when we were having this discussion is when we were talking about public health programs, because those are clearly programs that often will have impact outside the healthcare sector. And even in the past 20 years, that many of those analyses have tried to do some form of a societal perspective. So um, I think that was an important part of our conversation um, in terms of trying to think about defining the societal perspective going forward, but also provides an opportunity for teaching, that including those examples is one way to clearly demonstrate the difference between those perspectives. So we're getting a number of questions from the webcast, which is great. And let me just quickly take one, and then Joe, you're going to be the last question. I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut it there, but we do have time later. So hold your questions and bring them back later. Um, from the webcast, uh, one, there somebody's wondering if the session will be recorded and the presentation slides available. I believe the answer to both is yes, and uh, that's right. So it is being recorded, and we will make slides available. Someone also asked if the JAMA paper will be available after the event, and I will say we have permission from our JAMA editor here, Rob Golub, to distribute the article here, but I will defer any other questions about the article <laughs> to him, because we don't want to violate any copyright issues. Um, if I, and also from the web, two perspectives in one reference case plus sensitivity analysis, this seems quite ambitious to fit in a 250-word abstract. Um, <laughs> we'll come back and talk about that. Um, but, but I will just say, we did a worked example where we managed to fit it in. It is ambitious, and we'll come back and talk about that later. And you have the final quick question. Uh, during your deliberations, uh, two clinical groups came out with value statements, the oncologist and the cardiologist. And uh, the oncologist adopted a phenomenological valuing system, which was unique to them, but they both shared the need for robust evidence in their, in their uh, deliberations. So maybe evidence is part of another thing, but in terms of valuing the worth of, of the work, does that play a part for you guys? Maybe the, I'll just, if I may, answer by saying um, we have Mark Latke here from, uh, I can see her somewhere, who's on a panel later there, who was part of the group that put together the uh, cardiology recommend, the guidelines using value with the ACC and AHA. So and we also have uh, Lou Garrison and Bobby Du Bois have been thinking and writing a lot about value frameworks and all that goes into them, both on panels later. So why don't we just defer to that, if we may. With that, uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh,